Yo, what's going on? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing all right. Yeah. What's up? What's up? So, for those of you who wasn't aware, the the um <clears throat> the Trevor Buckham story got pushed back because once we looked over it, we feel we could have went in depth about some things, you know. Um, because I ain't no days off. We want to put out the best content possible. Ain't no days off. Ain't no days off, you know. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, you want to ready to get started? I'm feeling good, man. Uh, sorry for my attire. Showed up to my studio and it just disrespect. I ain't mean, did just disrespected my my studio. I guess cause it's in the lip cause it's in the living room. It ain't here. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> If he was going down the town, he would have put the tie, the suit, the shirt, I guess. I just wanted to be comfortable. Oh, okay. I hear you. <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all gonna go for that too, ain't you? <laughs> you know, uh, but it's okay though. Small beginnings. <laughs> Maybe I'll come back next time. I'll put on I'll put on my bed. All right, y'all, don't charge him for that. That's my boy. <laughs> that's my boy. Uh that's my dog right there. Um uh, but yeah, so are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So were there any specific events or experiences during your childhood that you believe contributed to your struggles with addiction? And I would say absolutely, um, especially the sexual traumas that happened as a young child. Like, um, you know, and when I speak about this, it's, it's, it's not uh, to attack or what that person did. It's, it's always um, taught in recovery to put it back on myself. And, and what this is about is the way it made me feel. You know, and uh, the way I felt was disgusted. I felt ashamed. I felt um, less than, not adequate enough. I would never be man, man enough. Um, and I spent the rest of my life trying to prove to myself that I was that. Okay. Um, how old were you? I was eight years old. This is when it happened? This is when it started happening. It went on for, I would say, a year off and on. Okay, off and on. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, can you share your experience of how the sexual abuse impacted your life? Um, I just, I just think that um, it was the main thing that my disease gave me every day that fueled my excuses to continue to use, to continue to uh, to basically destroy my life. Like, um, like I said, it was that thing that I was taking to my grave. It was that thing. It was the thing that made me feel the worst about myself. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, how have your feelings about the abuse evolved over time? Um, I would say like um, now, um, I, uh, I don't think about, you know, in, in the recovery and doing the process and, and, and like um, doing steps and stuff like that, what I've learned is like this doesn't cycle through my head. It doesn't, uh, uh, it's not the thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, you know, like, uh, and, and, that, and, and that comes from the freedom of, of doing, doing the process of working the steps. So you say you don't think about it in the morning. Was there a time where after it happened or while it was happening that you couldn't stop thinking about it? Oh, absolutely. Um, I would think about it uh, nonstop. You know, it was it was like uh, it was the one thing that it was the one thought that pushed out all of the thoughts. The constant. The constant. OK. All right. And in what ways do you feel the abuse has influenced your relationship and trust in others? Uh, oh, well, for my entire life i put up a wall like um you know like uh you're not gonna you know nobody's gonna hurt me nobody's gonna do anything to me like i will uh, make sure that i hurt you first or i will push myself away or i will make you leave me or not have a relationship with me um before i ever get involved get intimate get uh tell somebody who i really am or share those true feelings because like uh i just didn't trust that people wanted my best interest or that they wanted uh, a true relationship from me you know okay all right i was young you know like i was a young child and um I, I didn't realize you know the things that were happening were not bad nor good to me you know they were just things that happened just things that um 
that I did, you know, or that we did, me and this person, you know. And uh, as I've gotten older, you know, my, my mind has changed a lot over what it was or what it wasn't. Could it have been this? Could it have been that? You know, but um, I know that eight year old, I really don't have concept of what um, what any sexual relationship should be like. You know what I mean? Or what what uh, what a man or woman or whoever and whoever should be doing, you know. Right. Um, how has the abuse affected your self esteem, self esteem and self image? Um, I always I grew up with false ego and false pride. Like um, on the outside, you thought I was that dude, you know. Like I would make sure that that um, I could I could fight good, I look good, I smell good, I had the nice shoes, but I felt like garbage on the inside, you know. So I'd always dress up uh, the outside, but on the inside, I was miserable and like um, I didn't like myself at all. I hated myself, and uh, there was a, a a lot of times in my life that I wanted to die. Yeah. They um they say you can put lipstick on a pig and it's still a pig. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, okay. Um, have you sought professional help or therapy to address the impact of the abuse? Um, I've I've tried therapy and this and that, but um, um you know, like uh, what works for me is is what I do, the program I work. You know, okay. and, uh, talking to people that I have. You know. Your circle. My circle. Yes. People you can talk to and private and you don't have to worry about it being made public. Yeah, and don't have to and, and the thing is is too in working this recovery program is even if they do make it public, it doesn't affect me anymore. Like I have I have uh, trusted my God and what I think about now is like what my God thinks about me. And that's what's most important. So like uh, people let you down every day and you might say something and might get back to you, you know, but people have character defects as well. And you just got to uh, meet people where they're at. But it's a different um, when you know who you are today, that changed the dynamics. So like when, 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 yeah, you got a past life. Yeah. You done done some things that may not uh look good or 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 yeah you got a past life but when you reach a point where can't nobody use that against you mm -hmm. you don't you don't unlock i remember when i first unlocked that level mm -hmm. that's a level of freedom it's freedom like people think i got this on you or i got that really don't know you done done the work so you really ain't got nothing on you yes. you really ain't got nothing you really ain't got nothing that's right and, and that's the uh <laughs> the most important thing is like when you when you're free what i'm saying is do the work because once you're freed from it once you're freed from whatever it is you know like um it doesn't have a hold on you yeah. And, and that's when you know when it don't got a hold on you. Like some people go to therapy, some people choose recovery, some people choose church. Like whatever you choose, when you reach that point where, like my past is my past, you don't know, unlock that level. Mm -hmm. That way, because a lot of stuff hold you back from your full potential. Absolutely. But when you unlock that door, where you can look somebody dead in the eyes like them. Be like, you ain't got nothing on me. What you got? <laughs> you don't reach the whole nother, um, you don't reach the whole nother, uh, level, man. Um, all right. So you ready? I'm ready, man. All right. What steps have you taken to heal and move forward from the abuse? Um, definitely, uh, trusting in God. Like for me, I'm a big God guy, and like I don't mind sharing that. Like, uh, like I said, uh, but but um, like I said, the, the the steps, man. Like working steps, man. Like it's been the biggest gift to me. And, and I know when I came, it was like some cliche thing that people said, and I just thought it was like so. I'll just say it. I thought it was stupid. There's no way that this uh, step process is going to uh, help me be free from past abuses or past traumas or or whatever it is. But um, what it did in doing it is it gave me a change of perception. The way I look at things are different. This might have happened to me, but I'm no longer a victim of the things that happen. You know.
right. Um, are there any triggers or situations that still evoke strong emotional responses related to the abuse? Like, is there something like that when you see it or when you hear about it, it takes you back to that day as an eight-year-old boy? Well, I guess, um, I mean, I guess anything to do with a minor child would affect the way that I, you know what I mean? If I see something that has to do with this minor child or this or, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it always makes me think about it, you know? And what I'm saying is it's, is I don't think I'll ever not think about it. But the way I think about it, the way I look at it, okay. is completely different. All right. <clears throat> How has the abuse affected your ability to form intimate relationships or engage in sexual activities? Okay, yeah. So, uh, so I hate it. Look, this might sound crazy, but I wasn't a big sex guy. Like, um, it made me feel icky. It made me feel, uh, it, it made me have thoughts about other things, other sexual acts that had happened in my life. And um, so really, I would, I would try to, like, if I were to have sex or have sex relations with somebody, I would try to get it done as quickly, you know what I mean? And just make it like the short, I hated it. I hated it. Uh, but in, in doing this uh, process and being honest with my circle, and that's also my girlfriend and telling her things about my life and being able to watch her say, hey, it's no big deal. Like, that's what I needed to open up sex with. So it wasn't um, it wasn't no intimacy. It wasn't no intimacy. I want to get to know you and all that. And that's like an event. It was an event. Okay. Let's get it over with. So what support system or resources have been helpful for you in your healing journey? I guess just uh, once again, my circle, yeah. um, most of all, like um, a sponsor, you know, I don't have a lot of friends. Lewis is one of them. Um, but uh, my, my, my circle is it's small. And a lot of people don't know a lot about me because I don't share a lot about my actual you know, things that have happened to me, but I also believe that this is what I'm supposed to do. So, um, and, um, and y'all will hear about this, um, tragedy later on. It's from a previous episode, but like I said, we, we run in this, I'm doing this right here. Um, it's going to be titled unfinished business, the Trevor Buncombe story, because he talked about some things that I believe can help a lot of people, but instead of slowing down and talking about it like we do in the day, we just question, question, question. So I wanted to run it back. Um, and one of the things was about the the death of your uncle. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Were y'all close? Yes. It's had it on me right there, but uh, R.P. Uncle Chuck. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, you know, like I said, my father was there and um, not that my uncle Chuck wasn't an addict or an alcohol, you know, it runs in the family, you know, but um, I felt like he wanted me around and he invited me to, to, to be a part of his life, you know, and like whether he did drugs or drank or whatever, like he wanted me there, you know what I mean? And, um, and, and in no means am I bad mouthing my father. These are my truths. These things happen. You know what I mean? Um, I love my dad, but uh, my uncle was my hero, you know, and that might be hard for my father to hear, you know, but um, and if he could tell the story of the things I did to them as a grown up in active addiction, yeah. you know, it might be hard for me to hear, you know, but uh, what I do believe is that in, in this healing process, also my family is being healed, you know, and uh, me and my father have had some great times now, but yeah, my uncle is uh was the biggest part of my life that uh, I lost at a, at a young age and, and um, at, at nine years old, you know, so like, like it was this, these sexual things that, and then it was at nine years old, my uncle died. Just back to back trauma. Back to back. And when I say he died and I said, like, I was on the back of the four wheeler and I said, like, he died not even a minute from the house I grew up in, you know, like, um, I was the last person to speak to him. I got to tell him I loved him. And I and I realized as a grown man now that um 
God gave me that opportunity and that he knew that I would I would need it to get through my life. Um, but I don't I don't want I, I don't know how I would have uh, went through life if I if I wouldn't have got to speak to him that last time. He was my best friend. And um how how have your feelings about the loss evolved over time? Like, um, like I know when you first heard of, as a child, nine-year-old child, when you hear about your hero, which was your uncle Chuck, when you hear he passed, were you able to process it? Um, absolutely not. Um, I just wanted to hide, and I did. And I spent a lot of time in the woods. Um, uh, I also, I kind of like put myself in a fantasy. Like I would, I would think about him as if he was still, um, just down the hill, you know, like, um, I can't go see him, but he's just, he's just down the hill, down the hill. you know what I mean? And, um, and I lived in that fantasy for a long, for a long time. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, um, what emotions do you feel when you think about your own Uncle Chuck? Um, the, the one I feel the most is happiness. Happiness? He made me happy. He did. So, is the, so there's no grief? I'm sad. I get sad when I think about the one I think about the most is like how he made me feel when he was alive. You know, but but as I've gotten older, like I, you know, I I I, agree, I, I, I think I grieve my uncle. I'll say I grieved or this or that, but um, but I miss him every day. I wish I could talk to him every day. You know. So let's hear one story that you got. Where you and which you let's hear a story. Oh man, uh, so uh. My, my, his favorite thing to do was like we would we would take the four wheeler and we would go through the uh, we we lived on about fifteen acres or so, but um he would take me through the woods and we would make these trails and like um he would spend time with me mm -hmm. you know like we would cut the four wheeler off and he would just ask me how I am you know and want to know like what was going on with me. You know, and he would always grab me by my head and give me the nugget and tell me how much he loved me. You know, and like I needed, I I needed that. You know? what, go, go ahead. But um, you know, th those are the experiences. You know, he used to he used to slap box me. You know what I mean? Like he used to UFC fights were like his. That was our time. Like you know, the UFC pay per view back when they had the big satellites in the yard. You remember the big satellites? And I would go down there <laughs> and he would put the pay-per-view on and we me and him with bet money. You know what I mean? At like seven, eight years old, I got of course he gave me the money. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm betting money on who's gonna win. And like those are the times that I think about now. Monster Jam. Every year for my birthday, he took me to the Monster Jam in Charlotte. Yeah. It came around February. Every year, my birthday's February 12th. He would take me to he would take off work this would be our weekend you know and what i was looking forward to the most sorry i keep rambling about him is he always went to nascar races but i wasn't old enough yet because yeah. he went to the infield and they party down and he had the truck in this and um and i never got to make it to that you know because he, he died and he left an eight month baby behind who is now my cousin cody and uh who is a grown man and during my drug addiction i ruined my relationship with him uh, um, a lot of times, um, individuals blame themselves when a tragedy such as death um, happens to someone that's close to them. Was there ever a time that you blamed yourself? I always wondered why not me. You know, I don't know if I blame myself, but I always wondered, like, um, like, uh why or question my higher power my god like why would you take this man away from his child in this eight months 
you know, old kid. And, um, and I, you know, of course, so I would dwell into like what could, I think the fantasy was like, um, I loved him so much that I would, I would, I would have traded places. You know what I mean? Like that's how much I looked up to this guy. Like I was willing to trade places so that he could be here. You know, that's the impact he had in my life. Well, yeah, that's, um, that's a lot. Why not me? Why not me? Yeah. Um, are there any specific rituals or traditions that you engage in to honor the memory of your loved one? Um, you know, I, if, if I, it's September 2nd, 1999, that's the day he died. I'm, I'll never forget it. Um, I try to get to his, to his grave, you know, if I can, you know, if I can't, like, uh, I'll sit quietly somewhere and I'll just tell him how my life is. And I just, and I, I just talk to him as if he's here. And I do that every year on his birthday and on the, the day he died. Um, do you believe he know how your life is right now? Absolutely. Not a doubt in my mind. Um, I believe that, uh, you believe what I believe, you know, Jesus Christ is my savior and that, um, we go to heaven. Like, I absolutely believe that you can see what's going on. Uh, <clears throat> Rest in peace, Uncle Chuck. Rest in peace, Uncle Chuck. Um, earlier, um, you said that Uncle Chuck, you need some napkins? I'm good. Earlier, you said that Uncle Chuck was your best friend. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you looked up to him. Mm -hmm. um, you said he was your hero. Mm -hmm. But you also had a father too. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose Uncle Chuck and not your father? Um, man, that the just the way he treated, you know, I love you, Dad, but the way he treated my mother, the way he treated us at times, you know, like um. I do love you, Daddy, but uh, it wasn't good, <laughs> you know. And, and and I was just talking to my mom today about I would feel I would feel bad as I got older. I would be aggressive towards my father, you know, and um, and like uh, I would feel bad that my dad would be around, right? And I would go back to my room or even as an adult now, like I would go visit my father and all I'd want to do is leave, you know, because I love my dad. But like um, the last two visits I've had with my father since this recovery process and since like my dad's working on himself and I'm working on myself have been amazing. I've had the best time. And that's what I told um, Frida the other day. It's like, uh, I finally got what I wanted. I spent the weekend with my dad this weekend, and I had a great time. We hung out, and we 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 argued a little bit. We always do, you know. But uh, I'm just as much a trigger for my father as he is for me. We used together, you know, and um, um, he just wasn't somebody at that time. That I could look up to. Okay, where it was um, <clears throat> so you went through all this trauma as a child, and you didn't see it. Um, there was no like professional help or anything. Like you know, they put me in school counseling, and like like I said, I had the uh, behavioral help that I got prescribed my Adderall at. You know, and I mean, they, and they, and I was angry, you know. I didn't care what these people had to say or what they wanted me to talk about. They weren't living my life. They didn't know what was going on in my household, with my family. They knew nothing because you know why? Because I wouldn't tell them. You know what I mean? 
I wasn't willing, what I'm not willing to do as a child, and, and I don't know, is like I just wasn't willing to break my family up at all costs. It didn't matter to me. Like it didn't matter how much drinking or drugging or this was happening or that. Like um I love, I love my family. And I wouldn't change it. Like, I believe everything has to happen exactly the way it happens for me to get to exactly where I am right now. Where are you right now? Um, Saturday, I'll have nine months clean. I am a, a productive member of society. Like, uh, I, I, I have honor today, loyalty. I'm loving. I'm passionate. Like, um, I care what about other people like today I am the complete opposite of what I've always been, which was angry, lying, manipulating, sad, depressed, suicidal. Like um, today is a complete 180 of, 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 of my previous past 24 years, 25 years on this earth and uh, in nine months, you know, the, the, the work is hard, but it's very simple and nine months. This is how far God has brought me. And uh, and I cry. I cry so much now. I, I think like I'm a, a, a little girl, you know, because like I cry because I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Like you said, sometimes there is no words to express how you feel. And I just cry because I, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God picked me and chose me just like he'll choose you. And he picked me up. And he put me on some solid ground and he said, you trust me, I'll help you. And so how do you remain grateful on a daily basis? Uh, uh, think about, for me, my first prayer is, God, remind me of what it's like to be separated from you. And that's how I remain grateful because anything prior to me really seeking a relationship with my higher power was shit. Excuse my language. You can edit it out. You do it. But it was. It didn't matter if I had got 30 days clean or I got the job or I got the car or the motorcycle or the watch or the shoes. None of it mattered because I was empty inside. And that's the thing is we're all trying to fill a God a God size hole. And, and you can't. And you was talking about that earlier because we can get the money we can get the shoes the houses the relationship the family the bank account but when you um when you broken don't none of that stuff really it don't matter when, when you broken don't none of that stuff really matter mm -hmm. it also made me feel i'll tell you what it did to me it made me feel more miserable how can i all this stuff how could i get to this point how could i you know what i mean and and still not be, you know what i mean like how and i'm still not happy <clears throat> and the uh first time we sat down we talked about um you tried to kill yourself mm -hmm. absolutely commit suicide absolutely what was running through your head if you remember I do. what was running through your head in January the 3rd, February the 3rd, when you tried to commit suicide. And this is it. I can tell you the exact conversation I have with my disease, but uh, uh, the thought was, I want to stop, but I can't. This is just the way I'll be. These are the thoughts that went through my head. I'm not willing to go back to prison. I'm not willing to tell my son I failed again. I'm not willing to put my mama through the hurt and the pain. I'm not willing to destroy Frida's life anymore. I'm not willing to uh, lie to my nieces and nephews and, and pretend to be somebody. They'll all be better in time. It's going to hurt at first. These are my thoughts. But in time, they'll be okay, and I'll be no longer causing a problem in their life. And uh, on the way to the to, to get the dope, I, I remember telling my disease, I said it out loud. I said, do you want to use? This is the last time you use. And, um, and uh, um, I don't know. Um, and when you say you remember telling your disease, you're talking to 
I, I, I call it my my spiritual disease. I, it's real to me. Like um, you know, sin nature, whatever you want to call it, addiction, uh, spiritual disease. There's many paths to recovery. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is like the thing inside of me that is different from who's sitting here today is a real thing, and, and it lives inside of me. It lives in my thoughts. It lies to me constantly. So you're having this conversation with your addiction disease mm -hmm. um your addiction is, is the addiction is the disease so you're having this conversation on your way to cop on our way to cop had you already contemplated suicide absolutely i knew what i was going to get and i knew how much i was going to use i knew what it was going to take but i did way more than than was needed so so you so 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 and um and that conscious that we have, you know, you got the addiction on your on one shoulder, mm -hmm. and you have been in recovery, so you got that here. But um, why didn't the recovery take over and be like, uh, just get back? Or where was that God conscience? Uh, because because I, my my God consciousness was so uh, quenched. Like, um, I didn't hear, like, that's the thing I think about today. And I'm so grateful for it. I cry about it too, is I couldn't hear God anymore. I didn't hear my conscience anymore. All I heard was the lies. All I heard was the negativity. I just wanted it to stop, you know, and, uh, and I was going to make it stop. Like I thought, I thought God, you know, I realized that I, 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 I turned my back, you know, but I thought God just didn't want anything to do with me. He didn't want to speak to me anymore. He had nothing. Uh, nothing left to say to me so um so you you cop absolutely get back in your mm -hmm. vehicle mm -hmm. and you're going back to where at home that's right and you're still are you still talking to your disease or have you made up in your mind what is your disease what is you your mind <laughs> telling you uh it, it's funny right because like people say the disease wants you dead and I believe that's the long-term goal, but mine just wanted me miserable, right? Mine just wanted me at the lowest point and wanted to keep me there. Like, you know, like it, it didn't want me, it might have wanted me dead eventually, but it just wanted me to sit in this and feed off this misery, you know? And uh, I think that, uh, that on the way home, I already knew what was happening. I already knew what was going on. So like now the thought that pushes all the thoughts out is, how I'm gonna make it happen when I get back and, and I start planning. So now you go in the house, you get your stuff together. Mm -hmm. yeah. My uh, roommates were leaving. One was going to Charleston, he had already left and one was going out for the night. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I put Walking Dead on because this, the, the, the death growl of the zombies, like you know that, what they do and I put it to the part where it was a big long scene and I turned it up and then I did I did what I knew was 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 gonna work and, um, you did a shot I did I, I, I you know that's the thing is I did I did a, I snorted a little bit first because I was gonna snort I was gonna snort I was just gonna snort it off you know what I mean and then um yeah I, I worked it up and uh and I, and I shot it, and um, and that's the last, and that's the last thing that I remember. Not the last thing you remember. That's the last thing I remember. It's putting it in, it's putting it in jails, institutions, and death. That's it. And I have uh, now experienced pretty much all three. Now God gave me another chance, and um, I don't believe I was supposed to come back, um, except for God. You know. Like uh, the story that was told to me and how many times the arm came in and chest compressions and like, um, you know, they, and, and the crazy thing is, it's like, uh, it's not important who, but if they didn't show up that night, the ambulance didn't get there until after I was awake. You just say you weren't supposed to be here. You do supposed to be here. You here? Yeah. Well, well what, I, what I mean is like um I Trevor my 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 disease of addiction that Trevor 
didn't want to be here. I, and, and, and when I woke up, when I woke up, it's not like I had some crazy experience or anything like that. But when I woke up, something inside of me for the first time in my life said, um, I wanted to, I actually wanted to live. Because this, if this is what it brought me to, like if this is where I was at, right? Like and it's crazy. And it's, uh, I call my mom and, and I tell my mom what happened. And you know, my mom, my mom laughs and she's not laughing at me, but she laughs and then she says, I told you guys, got you. You can't even kill yourself. She said, there's something better for you. Mm. Leave a message. Uh, for real, give yourself a chance for that. Welcome to recovery. The answer is God. And, 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 and I hope you get there. Whenever you get there, like, um, I hope people in recovery can entertain you. I hope you can have a real experience, you know. Um, and the experience that I had was, was it wasn't very long. It wasn't a, a, a very long period of time, but it was, it was the first time in my life that I felt a glimpse of, of, of what it could be. And I've moved forward towards that. And uh, I look back and I see everything along the way that God has done for me. You know, even when I thought God wasn't there, like now I realize like those were the times he was, he was there the most. And uh, nothing a human has done to anybody or any trauma that you experienced is like an end factor. You know, like uh, humans are human. You know, and we put we hold people to a standard that they can't be. Nobody's a God except for God. So you can't hold people to a standard. You know, you got to move past things and uh, focus on positivity, loving, caring, and kind. That's that's what's been most important for me. And I'm not perfect. I mess up every day with my anger or this and that. But I have something now that I rely on most. And that's and that's God. For me. Yeah. And thank all of y'all for tuning in to Ain't No Days Off podcast. Thank y'all for real. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lewis. I love you, brother. Right. You're amazing. Um, man, give yourself a break. Give yourself a break. And if you make it to this part of the video, please like, share, follow me on YouTube and TikTok. And, uh, have a great <laughs> whatever part of the day it is. Bye. Bye. <laughs>